here just a second. Okay. So, hello and good evening. A uh, very warm welcome tonight from Germany. My name is Viola von Gramon. I'm a member of uh, the European Parliament, a member of the Green Group, and I'm also a shadow rapporteur for Armenia. And not only that, I'm also a member of the Euronest uh, Assembly, which is actually mainly focused on uh, the countries, um, post-Soviet countries uh, in the South Caucasus and also in the Eastern neighborhood. Tonight's uh, seminar, uh, I'm very grateful that with a very short notice, I get uh, esteemed speakers, well-known speakers on the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. And I would like to focus at the tonight's sessions on the security for the people on the ground, but also on our role, the European uh, Union's role, the European Parliament's role, EU institutions' role, international, uh, the US's role in, in the whole security situation. What can we do? What do we have to do? Uh, what is expected from the people on the ground? Why are they so frustrated with, again, the EU diplomacy failure, you can actually call it. And of course, uh, since people have observed uh, the, uh, let's say, level of solidarity with Ukraine for good reason, and we all ask for that, uh, the, it's not the same level of support and assistance <clears throat> in material and technical and financial terms for Armenia and many Armenians I've spoken to during the last three years are rather disappointed, but also rather silent. And I think we should um, raise the awareness, speak about the situation, try to analyze the situation as uh, best as possible. And that's what I would like to do in this moment. I introduce all of our Four speakers here, as I said, they are well known, they are experts uh, for, for many years. And so um, I would like to start with the ambassador uh, for uh, Belgium, for the EU and for Luxembourg, uh, Tigran Balayan. He is uh, the former, uh, as uh, many of you might know, uh, speaker for the Foreign Office. Um, and of course, he was following the situation uh, for quite some time, a uh, very detailed. Furthermore, uh, I'm very grateful that Stefan Meister uh, from the DGAP has uh, agreed to join us. He's well known from especially the German audience, but also from the audience on the ground. He was the former director for the South Caucasus office uh, of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, but also a long term expert on all the, I would say, even I don't like the expression, former Soviet Union uh, uh, countries, um, not just uh, Russia, but also Russia. And thanks a lot, uh, Stefan, that you have agreed. Uh, also, with a very short notice, I have uh, reached out to Olesia Vatianyan. Uh, we have met last time in Tbilisi, where she is actually based. Today, she is connected uh, from Yerevan. Uh, she will tell us more in detail what kind of meetings she had uh, for the last days and how the situation does look like. What do people expect? Thank you so much, also, uh, Alessia, that you could um, uh, arrange this um, participation. And also, I'm very grateful uh, that Professor Kopalyan is with us uh, tonight. He sits in Las Vegas, Nevada. So for him, it's still early uh, the day. And of course, he belongs to the very important and very powerful uh, diaspora of Armenia. And I think that he might give us some insights on how does the debate go on and what does it mean for the diaspora? How do you think that the Biden administration had handled so far uh, the support, uh, but also the strategic outlook uh, for the region? What else would you expect uh, from congressmen and congresswomen? Why is the Biden administration, at least for us, so silent uh, for the last weeks and months? 
So let me start and let us stick a, uh, let us kick off uh, with our ambassador in Brussels. Uh, Tigran, please, uh, you can unmute yourself. You have the floor. Give us a broader picture and give us a little bit of an insight what you expect uh, from the European partners. Thank you very much, uh, Madam von Kramer, for organizing uh, this timely uh, discussion. And I'm uh, really honored uh, to appear in this distinguished uh, panel which with renowned expert. And this is basically my first public appearance in my new capacity as uh, Armenia's uh, ambassador to, uh, in Brussels to the European Union. So, uh, and I'm coming from the Netherlands. I, I go straight to the point and, uh, and uh, try to present uh, the broader, uh, the broader geopolitical, I would say, uh, context of what, what happened uh, since last uh, Tuesday. And let's, let's face it, let's call it uh, as, as it is. It's a full-fledged uh, ethnic cleansing. Srebrenica of 21st century, even I can share on my Twitter, I've shared this uh, infographics, even the pattern of the actions of the Aliyev regime and uh, Mladic uh, forces is completely the same. Uh, for us, it's out of the question that the goal of uh, the forces that are behind uh, Aliyev's decision to invade Nagorno-Karabakh in violation of all possible uh, commitments, in violation of the legally binding three provisional orders of the International Court of Justice, is ethnic cleansing on the spot. And as the young Turks in Ottoman Empire uh, claim that after the genocide, there are, there are no Armenians, there is no, no more Armenian question. So this ethnic cleansing will allow Mr. Aliyev to uh, say that there are no Armenians anymore in Nagorno-Karabakh, and there is no Nagorno-Karabakh question whatsoever. Uh, I would start also uh, with telling that uh, we, it's at New York Times, I think, wrote it that nobody wait, saw that coming, which is a complete nonsense. Everybody was uh, seeing it coming from the day one of the illegal blockade of Lachin Corridor, all the all possible uh, genocide prevention organizations, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to name them, uh, were warning that this is coming. This is a start of the campaign, uh, the red flag alert, genocide uh, warnings, etc. Nobody was taken seriously, believing that a dictator can uh, negotiate in a good face. The, Replies to my questions I'm, uh, I'm uh, putting forward in the different offices at the, in Brussels is the following. Yes, he lied to us and we have no guarantee he will not lie again. Uh, and we should take uh, measures. Armenia was telling from the beginning there should be at least, if not preventive sanctions, at least threat of preventing sanctions if they cross that red line. So all possible red lines were closed. And the goal is for Aliyev and its allies is to take Yerevan, to overthrow the legitimately elected government in Armenia and install a puppet regime. This is clear cut. Uh, if Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the ethnic cleansing, is collateral damage of the masterminds of uh, this goal. Uh, inv the imminent invasion to Sunik, if uh, Aliyev and his regime goes away and EU and the United States will continue business as usual with him, that will mean uh, in coming weeks, in October most probably, we will have a full-fledged invasion in Sunik, supported by other Azerbaijani allies. For, the, for that reason, to prevent this kind of uh, developments, we have proposed uh, the European Union uh, a package of actions, I would say a sequence of actions with clear deadlines. Uh, I'm going to name some of them and also the expectations from each EU institution. Uh, to put 
now now the ceasefire was announced uh, oh 10 days ago nine days ago nine days ago till now there is no access to the areas where massive atrocities were committed the russian peacekeepers which were next to my village witnessed atrocity crimes they were murdered in the cold blood as the civilians and all the gadgets even the video registrator of the car was taken were taken away and possibly destroyed we and we think that eu should put a deadline in front of the aliyev regime in 24 hours if you don't allow the entry of independent experts of UN mission or EU mission, EU uh, diplomatic staff in Baku or in Yerevan can be deployed also as monitors to the areas where no one has control, no one has eyes. We are going to uh, suspend the visa facilitation agreement with Azerbaijan, which is in the hands of commission. Uh, which will basically means that Aliyev, his family, and man, any other holder of Azerbaijani diplomatic passports is banned from visa-free travel to the European Union. 48 hours. Then we are going to suspend all ongoing negotiations with Azerbaijan. 50 hours. We are suspending security dialogue with Azerbaijan. And I can continue the list, but uh, I don't want to go into the de details. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan also, the, there is a huge and big possibility that already we have seen videos emerging that Armenian millennia, millenniums old uh, uh, sites, cultural heritage is being desecrated, should be under 24-7 video monitoring available online for everybody. UNESCO should be allowed to uh, register the state of this heritage and then monitor uh, the developments around this. Uh, but as we are talking uh, about, and uh, I think this day it was confirmed that next week the European Parliament will, will have a debate and possibly a resolution on the uh, latest Azerbaijani uh, attack and ethnic cleansing campaign. I think uh, there are certain proposals that European Parliament can undertake. For example, only this year, there was uh, three times that European Parliament adopted two resolutions and one report calling upon European Commission and European Council to impose sanctions against responsibles, uh, against certain responsibles in Azerbaijan. I think that European Parliament should start with itself and act as an example for other European institutions by banning the entry of all Azerbaijani MPs, diplomats, and officials to the premises of the European Parliament as a reaction to the continuous disregard and mockery of the EU institutions. Uh, the famous uh, notorious tweet of Azerbaijani uh, ambassador to the uh, to, to European Union threatening to kill uh, MEPs is still online. Also, President Metsola wrote a formal letter to Azerbaijani leadership. As far as I know, she didn't get any response. And there was no formal apology for that kind of unethical, undiplomatic, and uh, openly hostile act. So this should have consequences, and the European Union is in a position to undertake uh, these kind of steps. Again, we have... Uh, about 300 students, Azerbaijani students, identified who voluntarily attended the illegal blockade of the Lachin Corridor. These students, we are of an opinion, should be included in a kind of a blacklist with no possibility to uh, use the uh, opportunities provided by the Erasmus Plus, Plus program. Any action? should have consequences. Good action should have, a, uh, should have a good results or good feedback. Bad action should have a bad uh, feedback. I think I have surpassed my time limit of eight minutes. Here I will stop and uh, ready to elaborate if there will be other questions. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much uh, for the first intervention. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that you get more time in the next round. There will be a couple of questions uh, addressed to you. 
So, Stefan, you have heard the package of sequences of measures of requests coming from Armenia. They all sound very reasonable. Do you think there is a real chance that anything of this, be it in Brussels or be it in Berlin, uh, will be taken seriously into account? Is there an appetite amongst politicians, amongst my colleagues uh, from which party ever? to really go harsh against Azerbaijan, to put uh, sanctions in place? What's, what's your assessment here and how would you see the situation, please? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Viola, for setting this up and thank you for inviting me also um, for this event. Um, <clears throat> I think um, working on this conflict, maybe not as long as some of the colleagues who are here, um, uh, but, but at least since a couple of years um, and also um, uh, were in the region working during the, the Second Karabakh War <clears throat> and uh, like you also tried to get the attention and the reaction from the EU side already at this time. I think it is again uh, for me very frustrating um, to see that uh, there was a war coming. I think everybody could see it, um, uh, but we were just waiting uh, and then we reacted. Um, uh, yeah, but not in an adequate way, <clears throat> but, um, but uh, in a very slow way. Um, and I think it's really also difficult to get to keep the attention also on the situation which is going on. And I think it's not it's not solved. It's not over. I think it's it's just the next stage also um, of a very dangerous um, um, uh, conflict which we have here. Um, and I think um, I, we, we, we see that that the reaction is just not sufficient from the from the democratic uh, countries and from from the European member states and 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 the EU. I think we, we have to really to say this. And I think we could already see that the EU could not agree on a, on a common statement uh, on what happened uh, last week because one member state blocked um, blocked the whole uh, the whole process. So I think it was again Hungary uh, who was uh, blocking here. And um, I think similar things uh, are also on the discussion about sanctions going on. That there are several member states who have no appetite uh, for for any kind of sanctions discussions, while other member states. Um, uh, pushing this uh, this forward, so I think it's it's a kind of a blocked EU in in a way, um, and I I only see a solution in a coalition of member states uh, who 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 move forward um, uh, and and really take ownership um, yeah on this. But um, I think currently there's unfortunately no really appetite um, on this. What we can see is an overstretch with many crises at the same time. It's a strong focus on Ukraine. Yeah, I think. Um, <clears throat> This also happens in the shadow. I formulated like this of what is of the big war of Russia um, uh, against Ukraine, and we can see that um, that that the EU and its member states are really struggling uh, with uh, several crises at the same time and and managing and reacting um, to to um, uh, several crises. And what I have heard also from different decision makers is that there is an understanding that Nagorno Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. Um, um, and um, if there would be an attack on Armenian territory um, with regard to the, the so-called Sangesur corridor, um, there would be a different reaction. I think this is this is this is what what the in internal EU discussion is. Uh, so I think uh, there is a kind of acceptance um, also from from the member state side. But it would be a game changer if there would be a, um, a more proper attack uh, or a real attack on the on the territorial in, in integrity of Armenia. But we all know this already happened, yeah. And there are already ta uh, territories taken also um, uh, under control by by Azerbaijan. So I think this is not anymore um, about just. I, I say this in in this way, um, just Nagorno Karabakh. But it is also about the the, the the future of the Armenian state and the and the territorial in, integrity um, of of the um, of the Armenian state. So I, I think what we what we really need is is deterrence. I think this is the only language which which is understood. But we have a reactive EU. It's not it's not deterring. It's not preparing. It's not sending messages in advance. But it is reacting when the crisis then happens, and it's always the same, yeah. And there is no learning process. And I think we have a big war in Ukraine also because there was no reaction to a war which started earlier. It's the same pattern also um, of uh, authoritarian rule or norm setting. We we can see in in, in a way and by by a very reactive um, uh, EU po uh, policy. <clears throat> What we when we're talking about sanctions, um, I think um, we promote sanctions. I think we need a kind of 
threatening with sanctions in terms of personal sanctions, economic sanctions, banking uh, uh, account sanctions, travel ban. I think uh, it, it's really about keep people in in the in the in the Azerbaijani uh, political system up to the up to the top because I think this is again this is the only message which is understood. We need to discuss also about gas. Uh, um, uh, it's 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 a little bit more than two percent of what the kind of gas what the EU is pur purchasing. So I think um, this is an option and we need to discuss also about the corridor and investment in the corridor. I think these are all very difficult questions with a lot of uh, different vested interests in the EU, uh, also specific member states who are benefiting uh, from these relations. And I think it will be very, very difficult again to get any kind of agreement. And I just repeat myself, I think without um, without a coalition of member states, uh, there will be no, no real um, action um, uh, from, from the EU side. I'm just going a little bit through the questions uh, you, you sent to, uh, to me here. Um, I, for me, the main risk is, is really um, this maximalist approach from, from, the, from the Azerbaijani side. And if there is no red line, if there's no proper reaction, then they, they go further. And I, I really, I'm really afraid of taking by force this, this so-called corridor. Uh, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, I'm very, um, also afraid of this Western Azerbaijan discourse, uh, which is which is now there. So that I think this goes much further. We saw also maps uh, about the Sangizur region in 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 the south. Um, um, so I I think um, there are these kind of discourses which on one point become reality uh, and creating a kind of reality. Uh, yeah. So which again, needs really proper reaction and needs a clear, not only clear statements, but I think also um, some, 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 some actions. And, and I think this is really, um, this is for me, it's really the, the main danger we're talking here about uh, a weakened Russia, Russia not, not able um, to act anymore or distracted in, uh, in Ukraine. And I think it's wrong. I think it's again, it's Russia also as a norm setter here. It's making deals. It shifted its interests towards the region. It needs the north uh, north south uh, corridor through Azerbaijan. Um, and I'm I'm really afraid of that. There already deals are done or going on uh, on on uh, uh, how to how to make the corridor possible in 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 the in the south of Armenia. So I think we really have to 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 think uh, be beyond and and to do the next steps. Um, I think the only thing which will really come, and that was immediately discussed, is uh, topping up uh, the, the monitoring mission in, in Armenia. I think that will come. Um, that's, that's definitely the case. And it has a kind of a deterring uh, effect, um, but without more around this. Also monitors on the ground there, maybe peacekeepers, international key peacekeepers on, on the ground there, uh, more transparency. I think more serious support also for, for, for Armenia. I think this is a huge challenge also for the Armenian state. I think there are a lot, a lot of many, a huge, which a huge number of people are coming into the country. So it's really a destabilizing effect also, which it will have. So I think it needs really more support um, and I would even go further. It needs also a perspective. It needs also a European perspective um, uh, at this point, even if it's uh, if it's still far away. But I think it needs also orientation. And I think that's also something the EU could could give in a way. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, but I think we all talking here in theory, uh, unfortunately. Um, but um, but I I, I think um, if the EU fails here, um, it will has a much wider effect than just. Just Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Nagorno-Karabakh. It, it can also uh, have spillover effects to the Georgian conflict zones and beyond, also the the, the in, in entire region. So I think it's a very dangerous precedent which which happens there now, and this lack of reaction or limited reaction by the EU and by the US, uh, to be honest, um, I think is is um, is further pushing uh, this uh, this this policy. So I just stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, as I said, you all get a second uh, chance to, to add some more of your points. Thank you very much. I absolutely share your concerns. And I think it's we can't be worried enough, to be honest, uh, while you see what this autocrat uh, Aliyev is up to. Uh, Alessia, we are following the situation. I read today that 65,000 people have already left uh, Nagorno Karabakh and almost Everyone is sitting on, on uh, suitcases. It's just a lack of fuel and, and gas. And that's 
I mean, mainly you are faced, Armenia is faced with a lot of people, but now I would be interested in how is the mood? What is the perspective? As Stefan said, I mean, an EU perspective is something, but at the moment, I think they need a um, perspective how to stabilize uh, the government, how to make sure that the elected government uh, keeps the power and they gets enough financial and technical and all the humanitarian support which is needed. Tell us a little bit more how the situation does look like at the moment. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I remember three years ago during this time, we were having a very heated debate about <laughs> the 2020 war. And you remember, we never agreed with you at that time. Well, you know, it's uh, it's uh, really, um, I mean, you probably, many of you saw the photos and uh, video footage. Uh, I have many friends in Nagorno-Karabakh. In fact, I was just meeting with some of my friends. Uh, some of them already reached Yerevan. Thanks God they are safe. Although I should say they don't really look uh, very healthy. Some of them lost kilograms during this blockade. And it's really very difficult to kind of to see and to realize, you know, that the people were going through a suffering. And then we could not really fully understand the whole scale uh, of the, that problem. Um, Indeed, we, we are seeing thousands of people coming. I understand that there are uh, several more thousands that are there. I haven't heard a single person yet who told me that there were either him or her, or they know someone who had an intention to stay uh, in Agorina Karabakh. Uh, I understand that there are some problems with evacuation of the people in terms of like finding a car or a bus, or sometimes finding a patrol. Some people are still kind of trying to help others. So they're on the ground, but I think it's a matter of, of days uh, to see everyone out. Um, and yeah, and in Armenia, um, I, I wasn't in Goris. Uh, I spoke to some people who were there and, and then I also spoke to those who were coming out and who are now already in Yerevan it's clear that it's a huge challenge to Armenia. Uh, it's uh, not uh, just uh, uh, the fact that winter is coming and winter is cold here in Armenia. So that means that there will be a need for proper accommodation. Um, and then look, I mean, uh, these people left everything behind. Many of them came here with just one back. Uh, and through all the suffering with military operation that took place uh, last week, again, blockade, um, and then, and then you have to spend also uh, more than a day in this huge line uh, instead of just kind of taking, you know, with drive of two hours that will take you out of the Granite Karabakh. So, I mean, it's a lot of a lot of suffering already. And then people feel traumatized. Uh, many of them are lost. They do not fully understand what their lives will look like. Um, they need care. They need support. Um, the government is telling that they are ready to accommodate about 40,000 families. Uh, normally, it should be kind of enough, but uh, look, I mean, this is a small country with, uh, um, with not really huge finances, I should say. In the past, Armenia had he in really problems with uh, uh, showing kind of, you know, response to some of the civilian disasters. It was not just in 2020 uh, during the war, but we saw it even last year. You know, I was traveling to the border areas right after the Azerbaijani attack um, in Armenia. And I mean, people were telling me the stories how they were running on their own and then spending days uh, sleeping in the streets, uh, you know. so. These are all the things uh, that would really matter. Uh, and then these are also the things that uh, will require support and help. And I understand that there are some humanitarian organizations, including like local civil society, they are organizing, they are trying to help, but there will be a need for um, showing, like, you know, like, and then uh, creating real conditions, you know, dignified for dignified people to. Uh, uh, for those who, who are coming here. And the other aspect, and which is what the international humanitarian workers told me, is of course uh, how to integrate with people. Um, well, <laughs> Ambassador, he is coming from Karabakh himself, but I mean, it's uh, it should be no, oh, no surprise to anyone. Uh, people in Karabakh, they speak a distinct Armenian um, and uh, they have their own traditions. Uh, they have a community. And then this is something that uh, will not go away. Uh, it will be very difficult to integrate. Uh, although they have Armenian surnames, they are different. 
And it will take years for these people to settle uh, and to find uh, kind of, you know, their own community here. We know how difficult it is to become a displaced refugee. Uh, I mean, it's, it will be even more difficult to become a refugee in Armenia while coming, uh, being Armenian, coming from Karabakh. So I, 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 with this, these are the things that will definitely uh, need like special attention. I think many internationals are now sitting on their hands and waiting for the government to plea for the support. Um, there is a need for official um, document to, to do that. And, um, and I, I really hope that with small finances, I know that people look at the kind of figures and they say, oh, millions of dollars, millions of euros. We, these are really small numbers uh, that are coming now that we are seeing from the US and the EU and different EU member states. There will be a need for so much more uh, to, again, to build proper accommodation and to start integrating uh, with people here in Armenia. I'm speaking about integration because it's, uh, I think it's more or less obvious to everyone that these people are not going back anytime soon. And I, um, and then in order to respond to that, um, we at Christ Group, we will be having a statement in, in the coming hours, in fact. And then we have been speaking to all different actors involved, not just the officials here in Armenia, those in Azerbaijan, in Russia, um, in Brussels, people in, in Washington, DC. And then we were trying to come up with like a different uh, ideas and options. Um, and it's clear to me from all these conversations that people in Washington and people in Brussels, those who have been dealing with this profile, uh, they are angry. Uh, they think that um, there was a lie, you know, including by um, coming from the top leadership. Uh, apparently there were reassurances like even hours before the start of the military operation that there will be nothing, you know? So um, there is this common understanding that this is not acceptable. How far it will go? I think my other colleague, I mean, Stefan spoke about this. I mean, it's clear to me that uh, it's not that easy, right? I mean, to go for sanctions or like some for robust uh, steps. I understand that it's still on the tables and then and, and, and then considered uh, by different officials, by different member states. And why it's uh, un important, look, I mean, we probably sometimes are too realist at Christ Group, but we are, uh, when you look at this, you understand that all this pressure, it has to find some sort of some translation, yeah? And, and then should translate into some real actions that will help to stabilize the situation at this very moment, but also uh, set some, you know, system or some formats that can uh, be useful in the longer term. And in that sense, I think it's really very important on the one hand that we hear uh, about the, the call for like a more uh, monitoring mission in Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, um, it's, a, it's a good call. People like me and Anna, uh, many civil society organizations, representative of international organization, that we have been speaking about the need for international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh since the 2020 war. And it's really very unfortunate that no one really wanted to invest into this. And I'm afraid that right now it's already late uh, to go for things like this because people are gone. Who are we going to monitor? Yeah. And, it, again, if there are those who want to stay, uh, which is their, you know, which is their desire, let them do that if they want to to live there. But the the biggest uh, concern there, um, and and why people were have been calling for the, the presence on the ground, international presence on the ground, because they were saying that the local Armenians need a reassurance that their rights will be respected, right? I mean, that there will be eyes observing the situation. If Armenians are not there now, why are we calling for the monitoring mission? I understand very well all other aspects related to transparency, kind of verifications, also uh, investigations and all of that. I, I am afraid that from my conversation, it's not going to fly. And, uh, and then these are the calls that we like to hear but I'm afraid that they are going nowhere. And in that sense, of course, it's very good that finally President Aliyev agreed on uh, with having with uh, UN visits uh, of uh, people from the UN office in Baku. Um, it, it's really, it would be so good if we consider 
uh, the UN involvement, not only for them, like a, for a one day visit to Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, or with areas that are now deserted and becoming, uh, you know, people just left them. It could be so good to consider also the UN involvement potentially for uh, some more conversations, de uh, detailed conversations about uh, those who are who left Nagorno-Karabakh, but they still feel that within their homeland, they believe that they have a property right there. They have graveyards there. They have cultural heritage there. Maybe not right now when people are just kind of, you know, they are trying to forget about everything and all they want is to leave as soon as possible. But maybe in two, three years, there will be people who will want to visit the graveyard of their family members. Yeah, or maybe we at some point we will see people saying that I deserve to have my um, my 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 house back. Uh, how are we going to handle that? I think it's really it, it could be so uh, so smart uh, to look at that with current uh, situation. Also, kind of thinking about the response that will have to come with conflict is not getting resolved by Armenians living in Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, with Karabakhi Armenians, they will remember that this is their region. And, and then for many of them, when I speak to them, they're, what I, I'm starting sensing is that they're saying that this is just another cycle of the conflict. Is it what we want to continue seeing? We Maybe instead of actually facing this sort of situation, we may need to come up with a framework that will address grievances, in, including the potential ones, and then what we will be hearing in the years to come. And then the first thing, and I, I, I'm putting it as a third, but all the people are putting it as a first, <laughs> usually. Look, uh, um, when the military operation started, what the Armenian officials were telling me is that they feel handcuffed. They were saying that uh, Azerbaijan is keeping tanks and at, at the border, and they understood that the moment, you know, Armenia showed any kind of even uh, a sign that they were to get involved, uh, uh, the fighting would spread to the Armenian territory, and we all know very well, you know, the problems that Armenia faces with its army for the moment, and also with the fact that uh, Russia is not, um, is a formal ally <laughs> with the very moment. So um, when the military operation finished, it's really kind of a cynical situation when Armenia again finds itself handcuffed. Because while it has this huge issue with the inflow of people and uh, and then with, uh, I don't know, with situation when <laughs> for for many months people, um, officials were threat, uh, they were um, sounding alarms saying that something is coming, you know, and this is what, what happened. And now what, what is left to them is to, to ask with European and American officials again to take care of the peace process with Azerbaijan in the hope that this can help to prevent another incident or another escalation now at the Armenian border. And something that I think no one in, uh, in Armenia wants to see. And, and then, then, you, then I speak to some American and European officials, they are telling me that, look, uh, indeed, we have to kind of, you know, to follow up on what happened. We hate the fact that uh, we kind of, you know, we were deceived by, uh, by Azerbaijan and we saw what happened. But on the other hand, we also have this challenge. And then if we pressurize too much, then Baku can just divert to Russia. And unfortunately, Armenia will have to follow because it will have no other option. And, and I'm afraid we all understand well what will happen in that sense on the topic on um, when it comes to the conversation on the corridor, so-called corridor between Nahichevan and Azerbaijan, when it comes uh, to the conversation on the border with the Russian interest there. So yeah, it's uh, it's not a good choice, I'm afraid, but uh, this is also the reality that we have. Very gloomy situation, but I, I'm afraid you're very realistic and this uh, is exactly what we think. I mean, maybe Professor Kapalian can enlighten us a little bit of how much this military attack and this um, yeah, we shouldn't uh, call it invasion, but the reconquer, as we, as we can uh, call it, 
could have been prevented and how much it is the fault of the international diplomacy, be it the European, be it Washington, not to find a proper way to deter uh, Azerbaijan and to make sure we have a civilized way of handling uh, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. Maybe you can start with that and then come and go a little bit closer. I guess you have also friends and families uh, still in the region. And if you want to add, of course, some more personal notes, please feel free. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, it'll be my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so from the lens of what I'm uh, understanding in Washington, this was a very large strategic failure. The United States expanded a lot of political and diplomatic capital on these negotiations. And so the fact that Azerbaijan was willing to do what he did is quite an act of humiliation for American diplomacy. Uh, to a few days before the uh, Azerbaijan's invasion, uh, the Undersecretary for Eurasia, Yuri Kim, very famously uh, in the Senate, made these very, very straightforward and rigid comments, which completely ended up being the very opposite of what Azerbaijan did. And so in that context, the U.S. foreign policy establishment, as Oliasa noted, uh, not only feels that they were lied to, but fundamentally they feel a bit of embarrassment because American political capital was not enough to stop the first ethnic cleansing in Europe of the 21st century. This is a fundamental uh, uh, issue that's going to keep lingering in the uh, foreign policy making discourse in the United States. Now, that being said, um, if we're talking about deterrence, uh, the underlying logic used by the Americans was that uh, Aliyev's word is sufficient for us. And so they fell into the same trap that the Europeans keep falling into, that the words of an autocrat has legitimacy. Uh, we learned from Putin that is not the case. For some reason, they think that might be the case for Aliyev. I suppose the capacity for lying wall creates a new threshold, but fundamentally, the outcome remains the same. Um, so in that context, uh, if the Americans were fully convinced that there was a pending invasion, there would have been a lot more pressure. But he took Aliyev's word for it, and he engaged in a case of aggressive opportunism. He was very opportunistic, and he used that 24-hour window to achieve his objectives, and the West was cut off guard. Uh, the visit of Samantha Power uh, to Armenia was crisis management. This was the, basically the U.S. administration conceding they got embarrassed and they dropped the ball. And so her flying over there immediately wasn't really about the refugees. It was fundamentally about uh, at least attempting to stabilize the security configuration. So uh, from the U.S. lens, uh, it's not that they were not trying, they didn't have sufficient deterrent capacity. They miscalculated, and this is why it's so embarrassing for them. The European angle, as Stefan uh, pointed out, is a little different. Um, Europeans do not engage in hard power politics like the Americans do. And so the Europeans failed in uh, implementing the basics of their soft power diplomacy and their values. So what you've had is basically on the footsteps of Europe and Eurasia, the consolidation of authoritarianism. And Russia's authoritarian orbit through Azerbaijan has actually expanded in the region. And with democratic backtracking in Georgia taking place, this is completely aligning with Russia's attempt at preserving its so-called sphere of influence. And the Western Europe was primarily cut off guard. So by purely looking at this as an Armenia-Azerbaijani conflict, they failed to understand the broader geopolitical configurations that were taking place. Uh, now, that being said, the United States does view the issue very differently when it comes to the Republic of Armenia. This was hinted at. Uh, my understanding is we're now seeing some conversations in D.C. in what I'm calling the proxyization of Azerbaijan, where the United States is finally recognizing that Azerbaijan is becoming a Russian proxy specifically to punish Armenia. And so the Armenia, Armenia's Western pivot has terrified Moscow. Uh, Moscow loses the entirety of its southern security flank if it loses Yerevan. And so in that context, it is instrumentalizing Baku through this conflict to reestablish some kind of influence uh, over Yerevan. Uh, it's an open secret, well, no longer an open secret, that Russia is seeking regime change in Armenia. And so I see the United States being a lot more concerned about that than the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. So in that context, for the United States, Nagorno-Karabakh does not appear to be a territorial issue. It's a humanitarian issue. As long as these 120,000 people are protected, they're not killed, 
uh, United States can swallow the outcome. But their bigger concern uh, is the proxization of Baku, where it could lead to an invasion into Armenia, a destabilization of Armenia, and therefore the fall of the democratic government, which would fully consolidate uh, Russia's posturing in the region. And it's no secret that America's objective is Russia's soft exit from the region. And when we talk about soft exit, we're not saying Russia completely leaves. That's not possible. But what we're talking about here is that Russia's influence is diminished to such an extent that it lacks the ability uh, to engage in authoritarian conflict management. So uh, viewing it through that lens, the United States is more concentrated on containing Russian influence and, and growth in a region and basically supporting Armenia's sovereignty, which supports and preserves Armenia's democracy. Um, contextually, there's an understanding now that because Azerbaijan blatantly lied and misled uh, both the Europeans and the uh, Americans, the United States realizes that Azerbaijan's objectives weren't simply about territorial integrity or Nagorno-Karabakh that there is a growing objective of Azerbaijan to infringe into Armenia's territories further. Uh, the rationale is that countries like Azerbaijan, very much like Russia, these regimes need conflict persistence. Peace is against their strategic interests. These regimes cannot survive off of peace and their institutions and the regimes are structured to have persistent warfare. So wh whether the modality of conflict is uh, modern full-scale warfare or in some hybrid capacity, there needs to be persistent conflict. So uh, Azerbaijan's incursion into Armenia, into the what we call Sevlich, the Black Lake area, for example, going back a few years, it's uh, attack into Rapan, it's absorption of, of territories near Jermuk in 2022. These are all basically mechanisms of instituting potential frozen conflict. So even with solving, quote unquote, solving the Nagorno-Karabakh issue, Azerbaijan is still holding various mechanisms of allowing for conflict persistence, and Russia fully supports this. The fact that Armenia's territorial integrity was blatantly violated and, and Russia, per the 97 Bilateral Security Agreement, refused to do anything, the fact that the CSTO was absent from the process, and Russia's uh, uh, justification was the same arguments that Baku was making, this clearly suggests that we have a Russo-Azerbaijani axis working in the region. and. Um, more concerning for the Americans and uh, I could imagine for the Europeans has been the very uh, uh, expansive hybrid warfare, information warfare that the Kremlin has unleashed against Armenia. If we see in the last two or three weeks, and Medusa did a really good investigative journalistic report on this, that the Kremlin has given direct orders to all of its mouthpieces and media outlets to attack Armenia. So in this context, it's, the, it's not simply blame the victim, it's demonize the victim, right? And this provides Azerbaijan political cover. And we also saw this political cover in the UN when Russia was one of the few countries aside from Albania who spoke in the language of protecting uh, Baku from any further political fallout. So uh, when we see the sort of these configurations, the United States now uh, is clearly understanding that outside of the Nagorno-Karabakh issue, uh, Ru Russia and Azerbaijan are working in tandem to collapse the Republic of Armenia. What that collapse does is it potentially uh, gives Baku uh, an access to a corridor, whatever they want to call that, but more so, the collapse of Armenia is the collapse of the Velvet government, which will allow uh, Moscow to reestablish Armenia as a colony. Uh, so this contextually, the U.S. interest remains more along those broader geopolitical factors. Um, so as horrific the human situation is uh, with respect to the population of, uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Artsakh Armenians are only one component from the broader American perspective. As long as they're not killed or massacred, uh, this becomes a secondary issue, and the primary issue right now for the Americans is Armenia's sovereignty. Uh, touching up on the, on the last part of your question, the, the human story um well you know as an as a, as a scholar i don't really have a heart according to some people so i can't really engage uh in the human story but humanitarian crises tend to produce collective trauma uh 
We saw this with Azerbaijan after 1994. We're going to see this with Armenia now. The problem is that, and I'm speaking from the lens of scholarship, is that that collective trauma produces a new political culture. And that political culture basically has a multiplying effect where it grows and, and, and uh, institutionalizes in the future generation the need for revenge, the need for vengeance. Humiliation is a very, very powerful collective political tool. And so a lot of the concerns is that if we're ever going to talk about some future peace, uh, these issues need to be uh, addressed. And the humanitarian suffering, while initially doesn't come up as the dominant political factor, a few years down the line, uh, is going to become an issue. And Aliyev's objective has been very clear from the start. He hasn't really sought military victory in of itself. He has sought to hum humiliate and traumatize an entire people because this produces conflict persistence. And so that component uh, with respect to understanding human suffering can and will have potential uh, political repercussions. And so when we talk about regional peace, uh, I think that's an empty conversation until we see uh, some kind of rigid action by the United States. There's been a lot of carrots dangled around. Unless the, unless we see some sticks being thrown out, and we're gonna, there's nothing's going to change because Azerbaijan has no incentive uh, to abide by any of its promises when it comes into the into the diplomatic lens. And noting its proxyization. Basically, with Russia and Turkey giving Azerbaijan a green light, it remains to uh, uh, things America to control this. Can, can the Europeans engage in some level of control? <clears throat> sure, the language of sanctions does the job. But uh, as was pointed out, uh, institutionally, the European system is not conducive to quick action and sanctions unless there's a mass consensus. And countries like Hungary under Orban are doing a great job of basically embarrassing Europeans when it comes to preserving their values. So in that context, um, we are going to need some hard power muscle from the United States to at least control Azerbaijan and not, not allow uh, the deproxization of, of Baku to serve Russian interests. I'll stop here and I'll, and I'll be happy to take questions. Very much to the point. Thanks a lot for this very clear, um, clear statements. Um, I, I think that many of us uh, can follow even uh, we are not that precise in, in our expression. So I will read out the first question from, uh, from the audience. Uh, it's uh, from Andreas Witkowski, also a well-known scholar from Germany, and he uh, uh, was writing, I see two schools of thought that uh, lead to completely different patterns of action. First, Armenians and Azeris cannot live together, and certainly not in Azerbaijan. Then we are indeed only discussing how to get the Armenian population out of Karabakh uh, safely. Second, in spite of everything that happened in the past, life together is possible. Then we are talking about trust building, uh, et cetera. What's the take of the panelists here? Who would like to start to answer? Ambassador, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I fully agree that this uh, viewpoint that Armenian and Azerbaijanis can't live together, it's not sustainable. As uh, I told you, the best friends of my grandfather were Azerbaijanis. My roommate, in a dormitory of the Diplomatic Academy in Moscow was an Azerbaijani guy. And each week his father was sending him a box of uh, different uh, delicatesses uh, from Baku by a train, including black caviar. Uh, first that box was appearing on my desk uh, with a message that take everything you want, I will take the rest. We were doing friendship. But after a year, we finished our studies. We have tried to keep contact. And he, after returning to Baku, he stopped all the contacts completely. I, have, I didn't hear about him since 2000, 20, uh, 2003. After a year, I have graduated from uh, the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, the level or the quality of the brainwashing and hatred brought us to this situation. Until recently, I don't know why, I have not been in Moscow for the last three, four years, but if you went to the markets of Moscow, there were a lot of Armenians and Azerbaijanis doing business together. 
trading with each other. Uh, for me, it was indeed uh, a personal tragedy that I saw that only five or six people were uh, coming up publicly with anti-war statement in the whole uh, Azerbaijani population. They threw, they were threw in jail. So, if a country wants really to the denazification that Azerbaijan is a good place to do the denazification or the, uh, I would say the, uh, even the therapy to become a more healthy society. And here I agree with also Professor Kopalian that we, uh, Armenia and Armenians has to be blamed also for this current situation. We underestimated the level of humiliation of Azerbaijani society after 1994. We underestimated the chance of opportunity to negotiate an, uh, a decent peace. Uh, that has some other uh, also angles, of course, that our over-reliance on Russia, our self-cheating that uh, Russia is there, nobody is going to allow uh, that the status quo will be changed, etc. Uh, and uh, what I see also in, in Armenian society, we are becoming a highly humiliated society with all uh, possible uh, negative consequences for the uh, mental uh, order and psychological situation, not only within Armenia, but also uh, in the in, in diaspora. But I do, again, at the end, I do believe that there is an opportunity uh, for reconciliation. As there is an opportunity for reconciliation with Turkey, there should be an opportunity for the reconciliation with Azerbaijan, but this regime uh, will not allow that because this is the raison d'etre of the regime. The hatred is raison d'etre of the Aliyev regime. Very interesting and very important point. Yes, I give you the floor as well, but Alessia has, uh, I think, um, finished her first uh, contribution with saying there is actually nothing to talk about because people, um, they, they create the facts now. People are leaving. Uh, so, I mean, yes, in theory, maybe you can also speak about Armenian Azeris, can they live together? Alessia, I don't know whether you want to say something to this. Otherwise, I would give the floor to Professor Kopalian first and then maybe to you and to Stefan, whoever would like to. Please, um, Mr. Kopalian, do you want to you go first? Okay, I don't mind. Sure. Okay. Sure. Now, the point that I was going to make is uh, in, in the scholarship, uh, we, we understand that political culture shapes social behavior. And uh, in, all, in, in authoritarian regimes, regime survival is usually hands, hinged on developing certain ideological or, or social thing, political movements that enhances it. Uh, so Azerbaijan's uh, state-instituted, state-sanctioned armenophobia is not a reflection of the Azerbaijani citizen or, or, or the Azerbaijani as a human being, but it is a reflective of collective political activity. And so in that context, when political culture becomes part of regular culture, this is where the whole conversation that can these two people live together uh, becomes inherently problematic. And I will give a perfect example. Prior to the Velvet Revolution, uh, Armenia's non-democratic government also engaged in that, that kind of a conversation because that modality of conversation remains conducive and consistent with uh, uh, authoritarian regimes or non-democratic regimes. But post-Velvet, as, as Armenian political society uh, has democratized, you, you will never hear anything in Armenian TV about uh, racist commentary on Azerbaijanis or glorifying the killing of Azerbaijanis. Sort of the, the, the dehumanization remain, remains incommensurate with democratic political culture, while dehumanization is normalized in authoritarian regimes. Um, we're seeing this happen uh, in, in Russia extensively, for example. So in, the, in that context, uh, Alyssa will give the human uh, uh, assessment of this, I'm sure. But at the scholarly level, based on the large uh, uh, body of scholarship that's been produced on this, and we even saw this in the Balkans, right? Milosevic produced an ideology that dehumanized the other race where killing them was the norm as opposed to having some level of function, social functional existence. Aliyev has done precisely this. 
So this isn't the issue that the Azerbaijan's, Azerbaijan's culture or their history or their humanity won't allow them to coexist with Armenians. The issue is that it's the Aliyev regime. And the literature with scholarship would say that soon as the Aliyev regime, for example, crumbles or removes, right, if you have a democratic Azerbaijan, this conversation will not end, but it would be a lot easier to be had because peoples with democratic values speak to each other in a different language than people who have authoritarian values imposed on them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let take over from here. No, it's a super, super reply. Alessia, there will be more questions uh, approached to you. Uh, maybe I give you the floor uh, later. And now we have another question regarding NATO, which maybe could be picked up by, by Stefan. There is a journalist from the uh, PAL News, a uh, Belgium Dutch uh, paper, and she writes so many times discussed this in interviews, articles, that as many uh, did, I thought ethnic cleansing was a serious possibility. What about the Turkish influence, uh, rat apple ideology, uh, ideology, Turkey also being a NATO member? When you give people like Aliyev or Erdogan the idea there are no consequences. They will only go further in the expansion, as we are also seeing in Africa, Syria, and so on. I mean, Stefan, this is actually what you have mentioned, but maybe you want to comment on that once again. I think we several people here made made a point. Yeah, if you <clears throat> if you don't show the red lines, I think they will just shift in. Yeah, and 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 they are shifted. I think. Russia was a good example on this um, uh, with regard to, to Ukraine. And I think uh, also <clears throat> initially it was mainly about uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and getting back the territories. Um, and, and I think now we can see that this is about much more than this. Um, and this is about the, the, uh, the Armenian state. So I think <clears throat> we, see, we see the limited impact also of the US on Turkey. Yeah, I think we, we, have, we have to say this. Um, uh, there is, uh, I had an impression when I was in May in Washington, there is a kind of naivety also what they can reach with this, um, uh, with this uh, diplomatic engagement. But I, I felt from both sides, uh, it was always somehow half-hearted. Um, it was not really serious enough. And I think people like Aliyev, they feel when it's serious and when it's not serious. Yeah. Um, the same on the EU side. Um, uh, so um, I I think um, deterrence only functions when it's serious, yeah. And and um, and it's sure diplomacy is important, and uh, and uh, yeah. But I think that's not the language authoritarian regimes understand. It's really about win lose. It's about costs. Um, uh, yeah, so and I think um, and th this is not the language the EU is is, is still able um, uh, to, to, to use. Yeah, so and uh, and again, I think the US has not really a serious interest um, into this. Uh, that's at least my impression. And then it's about Russia. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, but but then in the end, it's about China. Yeah, <laughs> so I think even Russia is about China is my impression. Um, so I think that's why I, 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 yeah, I think with all these links, which are there, the impact on Turkey, uh, we can see that Turkey is now becoming um, even more important in the South Caucasus, is filling this gap, um, <clears throat> is challenging in a way Russia, but uh, not really. I think it's rather challenging like Russia um, the EU and its and and democratic countries, yeah. So and I think these are um, in the end authoritarian regimes who make deals uh, and benefit from from these deals, and they have rather the interest of um, no non democratic so no impact of of democratic countries, no impact of the EU or of of uh, of the US uh, in the region. It's the same on on the Black Sea, yeah. Um, uh, keeping keeping the West out, yeah. I think this is this is the main goal, um, and I think. Um, yeah, th th this is what we can see. I think we outsourced this conflict for quite a long time to Russia. Yeah. Um, and we were just ignoring uh, that Russia always playing both sides and, and trying to benefit from this. Um, we, I think the ambassador rightly described also the failures of Armenian policy in the past when it had a different bargaining position and could maybe um, negotiate something something much better than now it's been in a stalemate. Uh, but I think we should not forget 
there was a Russian legacy also in this region, um, and uh, and we were accepting this, uh, and we were in the end happy uh, that we were not responsible for it. For it, and I think that's that's why we are part of we are responsible also for this. What is what is happening now because of this this de decades of ignorance um, uh, we 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 in the end had. Very good point. And exactly this is, uh, or not exactly, but uh, close to this is a question to Alessia from uh, the chat. What could uh, Karabakh officials do to prevent all this? Everyone talking about Azerbaijan, but there is no one side. So maybe a bit self-reflective uh, from your side. Alessia, please go ahead. Absolutely. Before the 2020 war, there were so many things that they could do. And uh, I personally engaged a kind of, you know, we had some really very difficult conversations very often, you know, about these things. I think with last three years, they were different. Um, the local authorities, they were in a very big position. Uh, the Russian peacekeepers, in many cases, they could do much more uh, you know, than them. And they were also not fully sometimes uh, realizing, you know, with new space that they found themselves in. The other issue, of course, it was uh, with uh, the legitimacy of the leadership. Uh, after the war, there were so many calls uh, for uh, new elections and all of that. And, and I, I think it was also another mistake, but I mean, it's kind of, you know, these are the things that should go to the past. Um, I believe that this military operation that took place last week was absolutely not necessary. In fact, you know, when we started observing with uh, build up taking place in the beginning of September, I was really, I, I was so confused because yes, there were some problems with the peace process. You know, there were the things that they could not really agree uh, on, but you know, people like me who have been following this, uh, profile, you know, for quite some time, we could see Armenia showing so much flexibility. And then with Armenian leadership being so much more even interested in finalizing with peace deal, I had regular conversations with all different people who were involved in, in the process, and I could see how much they were ready to concede, even on the topics that publicly were stated as a dreadline. Even more, the de facto for it is in Stepanakir. Since the very beginning of this year, I have been in regular touch to discuss what these negotiations with Baku should look like. I mean, now it's kind of uh, doesn't matter anymore, but I can tell you that there were very serious work going on preparing the positions, the stands on all the topics, you know, including the army <laughs> that became then uh, kind of one of the reasons why Azerbaijan started the military operation. And if you look uh, we, at these documents, it's very easy to see that the conversation was about the integration. So people like me were looking at this buildup. We were seeing all these tensions going on, you know, people being worried. And we could not really understand why, we, why is it necessary while Armenia was going for the peace deal. And Stepan Akert was about to enter the process. There were two meetings scheduled in Europe and they, they were facilitated by the United States with the support of the European Union. And at some point, they even negotiated with Russia on that. And then both times they were spoiled by Moscow. So maybe some time will go and we will understand. Uh, but I, I'm, I really, I believe that there was no need for this military operation if it was mm, to, to achieve you know, some just kind of, you know, with peace deal or anything. What we got as a result is uh, thousands of traumatized people. So many got killed. And then probably many more years and maybe even decades that we will have to live through with this conflict. While again, there was a chance, in my view, there was so such a very good opportunity to proceed with real negotiations and with the launch of real and substantial reconciliation. Absolutely. I can only um, reiterate what you have said. I mean, we have been last summer, uh, July, August, um, or end of July to Armenia, and it was really amazing how much, uh, how uh, high the level of cooperation was, of political will, of 
flexibility, of commitment, of understanding what is necessary. And I think uh, during the course of the last year, it even increased. Uh, so I could not find a single mistake which that government has done uh, to show any kind of provocativeness or, I don't know, um, uh, non-integrity or something. So there was a made-up story really by one side. And with that respect, um, I don't know whether that was always the case like this, but I would say for the last year, there was really a big understanding or um, quite a broad understanding from the Armenian side uh, that they need to come up with a proposal. And I think they came up with a proposal. So I, 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 um, I couldn't understand why this military, um, as you said, operation was necessary. Stefan raised his hand and then we have a couple of questions more, which I would like to try to I cover just, here, please. Just one, one quick quick point, because I talked to, to some people who were participating also in the negotiations. And I think there was an impression, I think Nerses also made this point, there was an impression there's no interest in the end uh, to, get, uh, to get such a result. It was about humiliation. Um, it was about revenge um, uh, and, and playing a game. <clears throat> yeah, so I think, um, uh, uh, and there is a logic also, there's a kind of power of the strength logic and to show this power of the strength and humiliating also the other side. Uh, and I think this this is uh, was what was was the reason in the end, and not to getting to a to a peaceful um, uh, solution. Yeah. So with an environment where Russia is very active, uh, and and we have this very authoritarian and aggressive environment, but I think um, this this revenge, I think uh, that that was uh, unfortunately the main issue. And and what we see now, and this thing uh, this point was made, is creating exactly a, a counter reaction, which 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 is similar and creates new traumatas um so and that's that's the sad story so sure it's possible to to live together but not if this is this kind of tit for tat policy yeah absolutely so now we come to the next question how much do you think the azerbaijan um uh to an extent russian corruption into eu and us has led to the ethnic cleaning in the region and second part of the question, do you see a way to push Turkey to stop further Azerbaijan aggression since Ankara trying to mend their uh, relationship with uh, EU as well? Who would like to? I mean, the corruption is definitely there. It's not this very open caveat diplomacy. It is a more covered uh, way of corruption, but I can give you some examples if necessary, but nevertheless, uh, Stefan again or somebody else? Okay, then maybe, Stefan, maybe, go ahead. Maybe, you first. Just, just, and just on this point, I think corruption is there. Yeah, I think we know the, we know the, there are the proofs. Uh, I'm just afraid of that's not the main point. Yeah, so I'm just afraid of it's also a lot of disinterest and a lot of uh, um, focus on 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 other things. Um, Sure, I think I talked today also to UK colleagues and and the role of BP uh, in the region. Yeah, so I think um, there there are some some also European countries who have their specific interests, and I also see really a systematic approach of selling gas, buying into some 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 people also. But um, I'm I'm just afraid of it's it's more than than just this. Yeah, it's 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 really also a kind of non interest far away. Um, which which has led to 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 the very limited reaction also from from the US and 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 uh, and also from the European side. Yeah. Let me let me also underline something. Uh, the lack of proper reaction. I wouldn't say that it is result of the corruption on the highest echelons of the European Union and the United States. The naivet maybe believing that someone, I mean, a dictator can negotiate uh, in a good face. Uh, but at least there are certain elements I see uh, giving the floor to media uh, or media opportunity to the most notorious members of the regime. Uh, Hikmet Ajiev, I think yesterday or two days uh, ago, said it's an insult to Azerbaijan uh, that it is accused of ethnic cleansing. I'm sorry, but giving Deutsche Welle, giving airtime to uh, the 
member of a regime which is well known for uh, its oppression of any critical voices, this is an insult to the freedom of speech. Uh, or uh, another point, the whole commission of the foreign affair of the foreign or interparliamentary elections of the Azerbaijan of the Azerbaijani parliament this spring, I think somewhere in April, publicly, and this statement is still online, labeled at least two million citizens of the European Union as the cancerous tumor of Europe. All of them are members of the uh, uh, of either uh, parliamentary cooperation committee with uh, a European Union or Euronest or uh, parliamentary assembly of, of Council of Europe, and still they are welcomed in the hemicycles in Strasbourg and in Brussels. I, I really don't understand. Uh, this is also a, a way of corruption. To leave them to shake their heads that they are calling the constituencies, the same people they elected or uh, voted or didn't vote for the members of the European Parliament, cancerous tumor of Europe. Cancerous tumor, uh, cancerous tumor the last time uh, was well, well called Jews on the European continent. They were labeled as cancerous tumor. And still they are going to participate next week at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, sit on the seats in the European hemisphere, uh, hemicycle of the European Parliament or Council of Europe, the same seats that you are, uh, you, you are occupying, maybe they, are, uh, they will sit uh, on, on your seat, uh, on your uh, armchairs. This is also a way of corruption. Thank you. No, of course, this rhetoric is absolutely unacceptable. And uh, I was not aware of that until you told me a couple of days ago. So we definitely will have a following up uh, on this. There's, there's no question. Um, anyone else who would like to come back to this particular question on corruption and how much you can push Turkey or don't push Turkey on this? Otherwise, there is a last question maybe for you, uh, Professor Kapelian, uh, regarding um, somebody asked as well. I want to remind you, Nicole uh, Pashinyan's words from 2019, no territories, um, about seven regions for peace, his Shusha dance, and uh, they a humiliation towards Azerbaijanis. Um. Okay, so we're talking right now about the current development in Nagorno-Karabakh and the ethnic cleansing, but I assume the question is specific to the 2020 war. Um, even prior to the war, until uh, uh, the, you know the, the end of the war, Armenia's bargaining position uh, throughout any negotiation was that the territories would be returned uh, for status, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the argument that Armenia was never going to return any territories, it's simply performative. Uh, but even if hypothetically, this con that, that's, uh, that is a subject of conversation that we want to talk about and assess the 2020 war, that's a different subject of conversation. What does a dance, for example, have to do with justifying the entire ethnic cleansing of a population? Right. What does a disagreement over territories, uh, uh, regions, okay, which can be resolved through conflict or negotiations, hypothetically, have to do with the current situation? Stepanakert, Mardakert, Marduni, for example, those regions were never part of those seven regions that we're talking about. So what does the ethnic cleansing of all of those innocent people have anything to do with one statement or a dance? Um, so this modality of thinking where we one is attempting the, attempting to justify the policies and behavior of, of a despotic regime is really, really unconstructive. Um, and so contextually, right, how do you address this question? It's very, very straightforward. Nothing can justify the cleansing. Uh, any president could do any dance. Okay. And let's give a very hypothetical example. Let us presume 10 years from now that Armenia has become extraordinarily powerful. 
Okay, because that's the mark. That's what democracies do, right? Modernization theory confirms this, and Azerbaijan down the line has instability because power transition theory simply says that whenever you have authoritarian change in power, you can have instability. And let us presume that in that case, Armenia initiates hostilities, which is rare because democracies don't do that. But let us go with that uh, uh, discourse. No Armenian would have the right to justify the ethnic cleansing and massacre of Azerbaijani people because the stupid things that Aliyev said or the fist pumping he did or the visit he made to a trophy park or whatever he did with his wife stomping on, on different symbols and et cetera, et cetera. One has nothing to the other. So this level of sort of, you know, very immature discourse that we see that tries to justify horrendous violations of human rights, I think has no space in a discourse. And so I'm speaking even uh, towards fellow Armenians that that modality behavior is untenable. So trying to justify one by basically engaging in whataboutism no longer works and, and the world isn't blind. So that's not a very constructive conversation to have. But fundamentally, disagreements over negotiation processes has absolutely nothing to do with the situation right now because those seven regions were resolved in 2020. Why after three years, we're seeing the entire cleansing of a population that's lived there for millennia? That doesn't hold. So I was just going to close uh, our event, but now there's one more question um, coming in and I don't want to cut this short. So maybe if somebody can or would like to react to this, Andreas Witkowski asked, I'm not sure whether I buy the uh, quotation marks, Azerbaijan is a proxy of Russia theory. I have the impression that Azerbaijan has much more transactional approach to Russia and that they want to get rid of Russian peacekeepers. The attack was a way to make them uh, superfluous. Does that open any road to Western diplomacy? I assume that question is directed at me. So when we talk about the proxization of uh, Azerbaijan, we're not talking about Azerbaijan being a colony of Russia. That's not the argument. We're not saying that Azerbaijan listens to everything that Russia says. Well, what the argument is that uh, Azerbaijan is, is serving as a proxy for a Russia to invade or attack Armenia. So it's a specific method of proxyization. And considering Russia's diminished resources in the South Caucasus and the complete concentration of resources to Ukraine, uh, Azerbaijan is becoming the military force specifically only against the Armenians and hence the logic of the proxyization. This is not referenced, for example, to Azerbaijan's economic policies, relations with Turkey, West, so on and so forth. So no one is saying that Azerbaijan has become a, a colony of Moscow or a satellite, but rather because their interests align on the specific issue of attacking, uh, uh, collapsing and absorbing territories of Armenia, the proxyization is clear because Russia cannot engage in that behavior Yet it is encouraging green lighting, politi providing political capital, and supporting Azerbaijan to do this. That is the logic of proxyization I was presenting. Yes, I think it's much more clear now. I hope that everyone uh, agrees. Since, this, since it is almost um, 11 o'clock uh, in Yerevan, and all of us, uh, I think, had a long day. Uh, I'm very grateful that so many actively uh, participated uh, from the audience. And I'm very, very, and even more grateful to all of our four speakers here uh, for this very lively and very interesting and also very inspiring uh, webinar. I got a lot of more information, uh, which was, I can use at least for my parliamentary work if there's anything else you want to add, don't hesitate to contact us via email or social media channels. I think there was a good first attempt and a start uh, for a discussion. This will be definitely not our last one. I just got an uh, invitation uh, for a trip uh, to visit Armenia and uh, Lachin Corridor. I'm not so sure whether I'm going to make it, but I just want to say that People are concerned. They are going there. They try to meet with their Armenians, politicians, with uh, people from Nagorno-Karabakh, and they try to um, get involved into the situation, find political and other support. 
So as I said, I'm very grateful for everyone who participated actively and uh, in the audience. Uh, for today, that is the end of our session. Thanks a lot and stay healthy, stay uh, safe, uh, safe and all the best to everyone in Armenia, Alessia and everyone else. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I hope to see you soon, Viola. In I definitely. Or in Belize. <laughs> I hope so soon. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye.